He is risen. He is risen amen, amen. You know, this past week I was reading through uh, the book of Nehemiah, and around about chapter 7, we read the completion of the wall and the rebuilding of the city. And then in chapter 8, uh, they build a platform uh, for Ezra to stand on. And as they were reinstituting the reading of the Word of God back with the nation, he stood and read the Word. And as he started to read the Word, it says that Israel stood at the reading of the Word. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, just for a moment, if you're able, please stand as we read God's Word together this morning. <clears throat> Starting in Matthew chapter 28, here's the Word of the Lord. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead. And he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him now as I have told you. Father, thank you for this, your word we share today. Would you use it to remind us of some promises that we receive through faith in the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ? Speak to us this day, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated if you would. As we work through the promise in verse 6 of Matthew 28, it says, He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. I want us to be reminded today that there are many promises that are true for you and true for me if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul. If you've believed just as I believe, there are many promises that we can apply to our life because of the reality of the resurrection. For brevity's sake, we'll only look at three of those promises today. Uh, in your notes, I encourage you to write down promise number one. You are justified. You are justified. Now, please understand when I say you are justified... I'm referring to those who have surrendered their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches very clearly that we are all born into sin. And that if we were to die in that condition, we would have to answer for our own sin. And there's no answer that we could give that would be good enough to justify us before a holy God. So the only way to be justified before God is to place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And his resurrection proves, it validates that we can be justified. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if I saying today you are justified, I'm referring to those like me that have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what does it mean to truly be justified. If you were to study the different doctrines of the Bible, it'd be referred to as the doctrine of justification. Here's a workable definition. It's the one-time instantaneous act of God that pronounces a sinner as righteous through faith in the resurrected Christ. The Bible teaches we're all born in sin Left to ourselves, if we die in this condition, the Bible teaches that we would spend eternity separated from God in a real place called hell because there's nothing in and of ourselves that we can do to justify us 
before a holy and righteous God. But the Bible also teaches, because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that his payment on the cross was all that was necessary so that those who are born into sin, which is all of us, Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, for those who are born into sin and place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in his sacrificial death and glorious resurrection, that we would be justified. So when we stand before God in Christ, he looks at us as if we had never sinned. Someone explains justification this way, just as if we never sinned. When we surrender our, Lord, our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible clearly teaches we are justified and it as if we had never sinned in the first place. Because his precious blood washes away sin completely. Past, present, and future sin. Now there are a number of places in the scripture that we could go to to understand the resurrection teaches that justification is a reality for those who believe. But one of my favorite spots that teaches the doctrine of justification is Romans chapter 3. So I encourage you to look there just for a moment. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. Now these verses begin with the words, but now. It's important when we read the word, but now, or the words, but now, to look back and see what it said before. If you look at chapter 1 in Romans, it says that the whole world stands without excuse. In other words, the whole world is sin. Then if you look at chapter 2, it starts talking about how Israel, God's chosen people in the Old Covenant, talks about how they sin. And then it goes into how Gentiles, that would be those that are non-Jews, have also sinned. And it says that left to ourselves, we would all bust hell wide open. Now that's a rough paraphrase. Those were my words to explain what Paul said in those three chapters leading up to this very concisely. After stating that, starting in verse 21, he says this, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith In Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now listen to the last part of verse 24. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. So the Bible teaches that in the death of burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he redeems us, he purchases us out of sin, he made payment for our sin so that we could be justified. That's a legal term. It's as if one day we would stand before God, and as the judge of all judges, he would declare us guilty, or he would declare us innocent. Those who have not been justified because they've never placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which provides justification, they will stand before God one day and he will pronounce them guilty and then cast them in to what the Bible refers to as a real place called hell, where they'll suffer forever separated from the grace and the presence of God. The Bible also teaches That even though we all start in sin, if we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who is God the Son, and that he really left heaven and came to earth, really lived a perfect life. In other words, he was tempted and always yet without sin, as it says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. And that he died a sacrificial death, sacrificial in that Jesus didn't deserve death. You and I did. He died on our behalf, not because he had done anything wrong. He died because we're sinners, because we have offended God. And then he was buried in the grave. And just like the Bible said years before, 
He was raised from the dead on the third day, conquering death, hell, sin, and the grave. For those who place their faith in this Jesus, the Bible says one day we'll stand before God and he will declare that we are righteous because we have been justified. It's just as if we never sinned because our sin was placed on the back of the Lord Jesus himself. I've said it numerous times over the past 15 months since we joined the Emmanuel family. My favorite verse in all of scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. The one who knew no sin. It's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not just talking about knowing with a, with a head. It's talking about knowing with a heart. It's an experiential knowing. It said the one who knew no sin. In other words, the one who didn't experience it. The one who didn't commit it. The one who never offended the Father. It says the one who knew no sin became sin. It doesn't say that Jesus sinned. It says that he became sin. That means he took your sin and he took my sin and he placed it upon himself. The one who knew no sin became sin that we might have the righteousness of God. Amen. Our sin was placed on his back. And then he made full payment for it in his death, burial, and resurrection so that innocence would be applied to our life. This is called justification. And in Christ, we are justified. I read a story some years ago Evidently, that took place a long time ago in a very remote tribal village. There was a tribal chief and a group of elders who led this village. The buck stopped with the chief, although he would often look to the wisdom of the elders in this tribe. And they didn't have a lot of laws. The laws usually were put into effect or were made up and then put into effect if something actually happened that they didn't like. If something happened they didn't like, they would say, the elders would meet with the tribal chief and say, hey, we can't have this. And then they would put it into a law and they would determine what the punishment would be. And this is how they would govern. Well, this was a very sharing community, a very loving community. And they had never had anybody steal anything before. So there was no law against stealing because it wasn't needed. And then all of a sudden, a priceless artifact showed up missing from one family. And they came before the elders and they said, look, somebody stole something from our place. And the elders said, well, we need to take it to the chief and figure out what we're going to do because there's no law against stealing. And now that something had been stolen, they determined that this could not happen. So they went before the people and said, what should we do? to the person who stole this priceless artifact. They said, well, if anyone steals something, they should be put to death. The chief said, that's kind of a harsh punishment for stealing, don't you think? And the people said, well, we want people to know it won't be accepted. So if somebody steals, they should be punished to death. So they put into effect in the law in that village, if something is stolen, a life must be taken, a life for what was stolen. They did the research. It took some time and they found out who stole this artifact. It was an elderly widow. They took it to the chief and said, this elderly widow stole this item. What should we do? He said, well, we have to do what we wrote into law. If not, then none of our other laws would matter. If we don't enforce the boundaries that we establish, nothing else would matter. They agreed. They said, but chief, you don't understand. He said, it doesn't matter who it is. What matters is what happened, and she has to be punished. We wrote in the law, if the crime is committed, a life must be given. And when they brought the lady there for the execution... They unmasked her before the chief only for him to discover that it was his mother. And they said, chief, surely 
there's another way. Surely you don't want us to take your mother's life. And the chief looked at his mother and he said, Mom, I'm sorry, but a law is a law. And we put in the law, if something is stolen, a life has to be given. And as they were preparing preparing to take the life of this lady, the chief said, hold on, not yet. And they had her tied to the whipping post, and he walked over to his mother, and he wrapped his body over his mother, and he said, now start the beatings. And they said, Chief, there's no way we can do that. We would be taking your life. And he said, a crime was committed, a life must be given, but I'm going to take her place. And he hugged his mother, covering her body, and they beat the chief until he breathed no more. The chief took her punishment as if he had committed the crime himself, and his mother was pronounced innocent. That is a picture of what justification means and what Jesus did to anyone and for anyone who will believe. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, if you've placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are justified because Jesus has taken your sin. Second thing we see in the passage is for those who believe you are and are being sanctified. Because of the resurrection, you're not only justified, you are also sanctified and you are being sanctified. Now, now if we look up a definition of sanctification, it's really simple. It means separation or to be set apart. The idea of this, when the Bible tells us that in Christ, because Jesus has been raised from the dead and is truly who he says he is, it says that we're sanctified. That means that we are still living in this world, but we are no longer of this world. And sanctified means we're separate from the world. What it literally means when God looks at you, if you believe, and he looks at those who does not believe, he sees two different things. He sees those who've been set apart through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and made holy in Christ, and he sees those who are still living in their sin. So sanctification means to be separated or to be set apart and made holy And as we look through the scripture, we notice that there are two aspects of sanctification. First, we notice there's what's called positional sanctification. Positional sanctification. What does this mean? Positional sanctification is a one-time act by which the believer in the resurrected Christ is made holy by the completed work of God through the death of burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of His Spirit. The Bible teaches we all start out as sinners. Those who place their faith in Christ are not only justified, but they're sanctified. And what does that mean? It means they become holy. 100% a completed work that God does in an individual's life. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 is a great verse to help us understand positional sanctification. Therefore, Paul writes, if anyone is in Christ, that means if they believe that Jesus really is God. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. When we're in Christ, because of our new position, God no longer sees us as sinner. He sees us as saint. A saint, according to the New New Testament, is not someone who lives some life greater than everybody else dies and is posthumously attributed or given the title as a saint. A saint is anyone who surrendered their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And positionally speaking, when we surrender our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says we're no longer the old person we used to be. In Christ, we're the new person that God made us to be. That's called positional sanctification. 
But the Bible also speaks of what is called progressive or practical sanctification. And it not only teaches that we are sanctified, the Bible also teaches that we are being sanctified. Say, what do you mean by that? Progressive or practical sanctification would be defined this way. The process by which the believer in the resurrected Christ is being made holy by the active work of God through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit throughout a believer's life. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he says this, and we. Now, it's important to note if we're reading this letter to the church at Corinth, and he says, and we, that he's writing to the church. He's not including lost people in this. He's writing to those who've placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, and we, who with unveiled faces, that means God's removed the veil from our eyes, and we've been able to see Jesus for who he is. And the resurrection for what it is. He said, we with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. Now look at the next part. Are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. Which comes from the Lord who is spirit. So the Bible teaches that we are sanctified. But it also teaches that we are being sanctified. Sanctification is a one-time event initiated by God where he makes us holy. But it's also a process initiated and completed by God where he takes the rest of our human life and he makes us holy. It's not either or, it's both in a similar way. Someone might ask me, Sean, do you have eternal life? I would say, yes, I have eternal life. John 3 and 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life started the moment I believed. But man, I can tell you with the aches and pains I'm experiencing even at this moment that I'm definitely not walking in the eternity that God has fully promised me. So even though I have eternal life, one day when I die, eternal life will take on a whole nother level. It's just like today I am sanctified. When God looks at me, he sees me as holy through Christ. But as I am walking in this journey called life, he's not through with me yet. He's still making me more like Christ. As we understand sanctification, it's important to note that there are two roles that are very important in sanctification. The first is what I would call the passive role. The passive role of sanctification. And this is that God will complete the work he started. Philippians 1 and 6 Paul writes, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God will finish what he started. But there's also an active role. There's this idea that there's some pure grace out there, uncontaminated grace as some would call it. And because of that, I can live however I want to. It doesn't matter. God's going to perfect his work in me no matter what I do. So I can just go about my life and do whatever I want to do. Well, there is a passive aspect to sanctification that God will complete his work. But there's an active role in sanctification as well that requires that you and I cooperate with the Holy Spirit and not get in the way of his work in our life. And you say, where is that in the Bible? Numerous places, but I'll give one today for sake of time. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. Peter is writing to those that have been sanctified, to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, as, now look at this next word, obedient children. In other words, we're called to obey. 
We're called to take an active role in our progressive sanctification. He says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. In other words, a believer can still have bad thoughts. And Peter's saying, don't live according to those thoughts. Instead, he says, as he continues, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, and this is in quotes, these words come directly from God back in Deuteronomy. He says, be holy because I am holy. So the passive role is we can be sure that God will work in our lives to grow us to become more like Jesus. The active role is, is that we are to daily and even throughout the day submit to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in our life so that we don't live like we used to live and we would live in the way that he would lead us to live so that we can grow into the holiness that positionally he's already placed us in. Because God's not through with you yet, and God's not through with me yet. Because of the resurrection, you can be justified, you can be sanctified. And finally, and this is not an exhaustive list, but this is a good one to end on this morning. And finally, you will be glorified. You'll be glorified. Let me define glorification. The final act of God, final act of God, by which a believer in the resurrected Christ is made to be like Christ. So he may stand faultless before God throughout all eternity. It's when the believer's faith becomes sight. And he will be forever free from the presence and the power of sin. This is when the Bible teaches we leave this earth and we go into eternity. The Bible teaches we will be changed. Romans chapter 8 verse 18 says it this way. Paul writes, I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul acknowledges that life is tough and that life can be very, it can even be very painful. But he says this pales in comparison to the glory one day that God will reveal in us. 2 Corinthians 4 and 17, he says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. What Paul is saying is that yes, life can be painful. Yes, life can be tough. Yes, life can hurt. Life can happen in such a way that we don't always full understand, but just know, just know there will be a day when our faith becomes sight And you'll be just like the Lord Jesus. And there'll be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more hurt. You know, some of the challenges I've gone through this uh, past week with with some of my uh, back aches, I was reminded of how challenging it can be in this life. And I ran across a couple things I'll share with you. Because I was sharing with one of our dear ladies the other day. And she said, Sean, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, getting old ain't for sissies. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, amen, sister, preach, preach. No. So, so I ran across these things. You know you're getting old when you call happy hour a nap. <laughs> you know you're getting old when your favorite kind of plans are canceled plans. You know you're getting old when your back goes out more than you do. <laughs> You know you're getting old when you get injured sleeping. (laughs) You know you're getting old when someone calls you at 7 p.m. and says, did I wake you? (laughs) Here's one more. 
You know you're getting old when you bend over to tie your shoes and you wonder, what else can I accomplish while I'm down here? (laughs) I want you to hear me, please. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, man, you have a hope. You have a hope greater than this life. And the Bible teaches in that hope that you will be glorified. Philippians 3, 20 and 21, Paul writes it this way. Our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Listen to the lyrics from a couple of songs, and then I'll pray. And then one day, I'll cross the river, and I'll fight life's final war with pain, and then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know he reigns. Onward to the prize before us, soon His beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. On that resurrection morning, when all the dead in Christ will rise, I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord. I'll have a new life, sown in weakness, raised in power, ready to live in paradise. I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord. I'll have a new life. Glory, glory, never sad. There will be no more sorrow. There'll be no more strife. In his likeness, I'll be glad. I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. Father, thank you for your word this morning and the promises that flow from the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I thank you that in him we can be justified, that if in him we'll be sanctified. And, and Lord, I thank you that one day because of the Lord Jesus and his glorious resurrection, one day those who believe will be glorified. God, have your will and your way in these next moments, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing a final song. As we sing this final song today, if you've never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to encourage you while we're singing, some of our pastors will be up front come and let them know. Say, look, I've never given my life to Jesus, and I think I need to. If you've surrendered your life to Christ, but you've never been baptized, just like you saw the testimony of the young man baptized earlier, received Christ years ago, but now realize he needed to be baptized, you come let one of our pastors know. This is where you go to church, and when you go to church and you've not made it your church home, we would love for you to officially become a part of our family. Just come let one of our pastors know. We prayed last week for rain. We had not had a whole lot since then. We need to continue to pray for rain. We need to continue to ask God to do what our forecasters don't say looks like it's coming anytime soon because we do need rain. Whatever need you have in your journey, if you feel the need to step out, come up and use this as a good old-fashioned altar, kneel down and pray, you feel free to do that. If not, You just sing in your seats and pray for those that God might be working in their hearts. So stand if you would, move if you need to, and sing with us.